Friends, enemies, listeners, hate listeners, and coats. Hello and welcome to the Grade Cricketer podcast. Your boy Pezza is anchoring this week as my friend, your friend, our dear friend, the irreplaceable Ian Higgins, takes a well overdue break from proceedings for the time being. But the cricket industrial complex mercilessly rolls on, dragging our tired minds and eyes with it. So it is a bumper show this week, and we do not apologize for it. Coming up, our women, our women annihilate Pakistan. Ash Gardner speaks up about Australia Day. Steve Smith's doing savant stuff. Dan Christian and Steve Eskenazi join the show. Cricket New South Wales is a disgrace, according to reports. Shubman Gill goes white ball daddy. David Cameron watches Alex Hales turn up at the Sheikh Zayed. Root does something in South Africa. Bored apes hack RCB Twitter. West Indies cricket may cease to exist as an entity, according to their own report. Ask TJC ponders whether or not Winviz is nonce gear. And Michael Clark limps his way into a story that not even a chat GPT super robot could produce for the Daily Mail. We have only ever been able to cover the bizarre breadth of this stupid, stupid game with the support of one of Australia's best fledgling brands, Budgie Smuggler. Today is a fond farewell to that friend. And it's not a cold farewell either. After five years of sterling support, Budgie Smuggler and TGC bids farewell. We're going to catch up with CEO Adam Linforth to assure everybody that we're still friends. Uh, and to say our thanks properly as well. And to celebrate that fruitful association, ladies and gentlemen, as I roll on here for the first time in my first ever intro, Linny is throwing 20% off the entire range of Budgie Smuggler for the end of the month, until the end of the month. In fact, it's actually to the first test in Nagpur, Feb 9, if you simply enter the code RIG, and that's in capital letters, R-I-G. I say ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest, it's lady and gentlemen. Uh, if you want to chat about being this podcast presenting sponsor, in the meantime, get in touch. Gradecricketer at gmail.com. So Budgie's gone for a while. He goes has gone extremely temporarily and he's back shortly. But where we've lost that smooth masculine voice, that quick wit, the chest, the pipes, the salad of Ian Higgins, we've gained 20 odd 18 test matches. And a man, interestingly, connected with a number of the stories above, and we'll see what he wants to say about that. So to guest co-host today, uh, it is former test opening bat, Cricket New South Wales board member, a man with the same first grade and first class cricket average, which says something about the quality of Sydney grade cricket, dismissed for naught in last man stands on Thursday against a team called the Spider Monkeys. We thank the Grandstand Cricket Podcast for letting him run around with us. It is best friend of the show, Ed, Ted Cowan, Teddy, the warmest of welcomes into the co-host seat of The Great Cricketer. Oh, Pez. Wow. What an intro. Thank you. I feel the warmth. I've got a little bit to pick up on just from the intro alone. I just hope Budgie Smuggler aren't going out of business. Can you confirm that voluntary administration is not on the table for what is my favorite swimwear? I can confirm that. Um, I have already spoken to Adam Limforth for this show, um, so I'll spoil one part of it. Um, basically, he called me and said, look, Pez, after five years, I'm pretty sure our uh, your audience is familiar with our brand. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think it's more budgie smuggler going like, fly my pretties, you know, us yeah, being yeah. the monkeys from Wizard of Oz um, and just just letting us fly. So again, once again, if you're sitting in that car and you're like, oh, maybe our brand could, you know, wants to speak to a couple of 18 to 40 year olds, uh, male, males who are insecure, which is a pretty big market. Well, then, you know, get the in touch perfect, by creator gmail.com. The perfect budgie smuggler audience. Mm. Do you have a favorite pair of budgies? I do. Mine are the tropical pattern, but they've got the Canberra Raiders logo oh, just nice. on the top left. Oh, it's got a bit of both. It's a little bit summer. And mm. a little bit winter, a little bit bogan, and a little bit chic. Mm. Yeah, well, and that and that and that's that describes budgie smuggler, uh, you know, in one fell swoop. They, they actually do so many good pairs of smugglers, like, and they've given us a fair few over the years. I mean, I've got three separate pairs of North Sydney Bears smugglers. Uh, I'd love you to and, post a photo of you wearing your smugglers. I mean, that would be a sight for beautiful yeah, eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Couple of months required on the old um, rig, rigatoni, uh, the rigatoni circuit um, mm. before that uh, even comes into my mind. Ed, um, so many things to talk about this week, so little time as per usual. So the most important thing, um, you globe last man stands. I know it's been covered on the excellent Gra mm. uh, Grandstand Cricket podcast, but um, I don't think it got into the weeds of yeah, how I'm, you I'm, felt. I'm, yeah, I mean, uh, you you have like. 
you have can... a higher score in test cricket of 136 mm. against Stain and Morkel at the Gabba and you got knocked over for zero against the spider monkeys. Let me, let me give some color and context. So let's just wind back the clock and the invitation hits the inbox for a couple short fancy a game for the short covers. We're nine from nine top of the table clash short covers versus spider monkeys. The spider monkeys also nine for nine. So this is like a, a wow. prelim final of sorts. The short wow. covers includes three people that have won first grade premierships in Sydney test cricket alone. Right. So I'm thinking this is a, this is an absolute cakewalk. Mm. We're, we're going to absolutely piss this in. So I go to the storage unit. I get out wonder bat. wonder bats last four hits. I think were hundred, hundred, double hundred, hundred. This thing bats itself. Put a little photo on the WhatsApp. Wonder bats out of off the ice bucket. It's ready mm. to roll. Thinking last man stands. It bats itself. Yep. It, ba it bats itself. Mm. Turn up to Moore Park, number five outfield. Go track hilly. Like it's just, it's not the mm. manicured SCG. I'm thinking mm. I'm gonna have to go aerial today. There's no there's no chance of me hitting a four with my puny little arms. Mm. Other team gets 120, which apparently in last man stands parlance is below par. Unders massively under so mm. i think we're, we're cock a hoop at this stage we lose one we lose two stride to the crease last man stands three people each side are usually on the boundary they've got two people they've got a short cover and a short mid wicket giving the lip <laughs> giving the lip sure enough old reese Longbottom, dreadlocks and all slings this thing down i swear to god first one took off just straight through the top of the synth though Next one hit the other side of that ridge, rolled along the ground, knocked my oh. stuff down the ground. Only shaking my head in disbelief. The highlight of the story, I think, is I was did you to... did, hang on? Did you look at the deck, the the synthetic wicket after? So you're claiming ridges on the synthetic wicket? Tote, absolutely. They're, honestly, lit, went back to a ball land halfway down. Next thing I know, under the bat. See you later, pal. <laughs> Send off. Anyway, the highlight for me might not be the highlight for you. Is I, I speak to my wife kind of disconsolately that mm. night i so said she she's away which gave me the the leave pass to play last mm. man stands and have four beers right, yeah. uh <clears throat> rock and roll and she's oh how'd you go how was it did you enjoy it i was like oh pretty good product didn't score any runs she goes oh what what do you mean i said yeah I, I, you wouldn't believe it but the ball rolled along the ground and she goes mm. honestly mate for 15 years, all I've had to put up with was you whinging about umpiring decisions and never being out. And here you are playing park cricket and you're telling me that you're not out in park. I was like, you wouldn't believe it. She said, beep, beep, hung up wow. on me. That's a good, uh, I'm sure the spider monkeys don't have a song and it's kind of um, kind of worryingly close to the, the word rock spider, but, um, but that's a different thing. But that, they must have, that must have been a great circuit for them you know, a, a great more park circuit post games of three Sydney uni first grade premiers. Is that right? And, well, four, and including then, yeah. four, including yourself. And then the test, the test batsman comes out and they knock him over. And mm. I, I mean, did they have any pedigree at all? Or are these literally just like, um, are these guys have anything? Not that I could really tell. If yeah, I was being completely know. honest. No, I didn't, I didn't know of them. No uh, one came up to you afterwards and said, oh, I actually played against you once. Well, you know. No, yeah. one guy was like, I was fitting on the fence. He goes, oh, that guy looks like Ed Cowan. He goes, oh, yeah, Ed. And I look up and he goes, oh, shit, it is Ed Cowan. <laughs> <laughs> and and th so they, they won. Is that right? Or oh, easily. You... Absolutely pissed it in. Like beat us, I, know, I think, with a bonus point. So they go top of the table. Yeah, uh, short covers in absolute disarray. Anyway, it was a okay. for all, for all the issues around participation in cricket. The umpire literally signed me up as I gave him my hat. He registered okay. me. Like okay. good product, good product. Okay, you said it's it's interesting, you know, because we're obviously they teach you in um, communication school to lead with the most important thing happening in the game. So I'm glad we started here instead of the the actual professional game. Um, I took my two children down to Tony Dottomate Oval in Footscray on a Sunday on afternoon. Day, I, had, I had, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> is now, is, is, in Footscray. Is he or is he not? Is Teddy, your son, not named after Teddy? Um, look, to, to be honest, I, I, part of the allure of calling him Ted was mm. knowing that that would then roll into Teddy Bear, which then is a homage to North Sydney Bears. Um, which that was what I totally misread the situation. So that's what I would tell water. Get on with the story. 
Yeah. Well, anyway, Tony Dodderman Oval, it's opposite Murphy's Oval, fourth grade was still playing. And basically I had my kids for um, both Saturday and Sunday uh, with, with my wife working night shift and sleeping during the day. So not only do I have them both days, which is obviously a blessing, um, but very Astros. fucking, very fucking <laughs> difficult, um, especially on the like the, the last session on the second day. A hot um, but, but summer's get, day with two yeah, kids. It was, and had to get out of the house. So, you know, I'm like, all right, ice cream, and let's do a lap around a grade cricket oval, you know, just to amuse. And one thing I noted, uh, and, and Footscray, the, uh, my local team, did knock over Carlton, that there was only one official umpire. What? In fourth in grade? grade. Yeah, um, going from diamond. yeah, and and I'm just concerned about that. I mean, is the world moving to last man stands? You know, where you can get signed up digitally. D- does grade cricket need to digitize in some way? Um, don't need to answer that question. Just a little bit of a, a note on on the state of club cricket. Last man stands hot. Grade cricket not. Congratulations to Jake Brown, by the way, Saka Premier Cricket's top ever run scorer. Um, you know. Uh, not sure if he's got a game for South Australia, but I will come to you yeah. later about whether you need to play 17s or 19s to get a gig. Uh, the Greg Mayle of South Australian great cricket. <laughs> um, all right, he goes, this is what people, he goes, see, see this is the fun. Oh, this my what? what? Is yeah. He goes, like, I'm a bit worried about him on two fronts. He Have is, you, I is. mean, there, there is a rumour doing the way that this is just all part of the grander plan of you taking over TGC. I mean, there is some history here for those long time, <laughs> those long time listeners realize that it wasn't always yeah. you, you guys. Oh, what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. I mean, look, don't get close to me. That's all I'm saying. You know? Exactly. Um, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. You know, exactly. Icarus, Dictator. you know, exactly. once again, he goes flew close to the sun, me being the sun. Uh, no, not at all. Um, Basically, we've been going really, really fucking hard since the World Cup. And um, in uh, for Higo specifically, a lot of that during the World Cup, the Teach Me World Cup, he was, he was back after we were recording to yeah. do some editing and producing as well. So he's um, we've probably been silly in not insisting on a break to this point. And uh, it was just time okay, um, for him. So life. he's very, very welcome. It's also um, t- tired after circuiting post live show tour around the, around the country. I can't but, comment. But it was on a that. great, great success. Great yes, success. Yeah. There was, there was a bit of circuiting. Um, all right. Look, we're really late on this and apologies to all the listeners out there for not um, dropping our lives respectively to cover what is probably the key cultural moment in um, this decade, at least. But um, Easily. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, Pup, our mate, Pup, your, your teammate. The um, Pupster, Pup. my former captain, I think is. As soon as sir, I. Or sir, as he liked to be uh, described. Well, um, I just got the, t- I just got. Um, I got the text. I got a message from somebody. It was, it was an audience member um, pretty soon after it happened and realized as soon as I, um, as soon as I got the video that we were about to get inundated and we were, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it is 2023. So this is now old news. Uh, I think it happened four days ago, five days ago. But um, so I think everything's been said, you know, um, it's a walking Daily Mail headline. Um, I saw somebody describe it as, you know, V600 for Vendetta. Um, you know, what happened on December 17. I, I know what you did uh, on December 17. Um, and I suppose the, look, uh, you know, I don't know about your experience with it. Um, I think it bears some kind of comment. I shared it with a couple of mates uh, mm. and that, you know, you, you get around by, these kind of by, things. By on that, WhatsApp you mean group. WhatsApp forwards. <laughs> You may yeah. share it with a couple yeah. of mates. Is you shared the the extended video with yeah. everyone you know via WhatsApp. Is that what you meant? I it was one. No, I, I thought about it. It was one group of trusted friends, two guys. Uh, because, but because I think the first thing to say about it is, I, I like I I think it's uh in the main quite a distressing video, mm. <laughs> and um, it's quite tawdry and you know it, it yeah, obviously the internet is, the internet is going to pick it and pick it up and yeah. um and run with the the salaciousness of it all and in trusted groups it is very funny but i think in um mainstream contexts the the, the major thing that's going on is quite distressing and doesn't bear comment but dis- but but, un- but unfortunately um, or fortunately, there's about 10 subplots afterwards that are probably the fucking funniest things I've ever seen on the internet. Uh, is one of those is is one of those the hamstring going pink <laughs> mid scuffle? <laughs> but like not and not the, just the limping, and uh, just the guy he's had soft yeah. tissue inju- injuries his whole life. Like, I mean, they never go away. I mean, they never go away. I mean, it's not just that it pings, but but he's he's 
he's moving quite quickly uh, to where where he needs to go, you know, for the next thing that he wants to do and very dramatically holding that hamstring, the back of the leg. Mm. And simultaneously, and I think this is punching up enough to, 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 co- to cover this, but, you know, not only is he calling his friend Carlos, you know, a Carmichael Hunt, um, but he's calling him Carlos at the same time. <laughs> You know, like it's like, uh, uh, is, is that is that is that Australian masculinity in one go or not? Like, uh, you know, and it's and he's I you Which can is comment ironic. on this. I haven't even thought about this. The way that he says that word, we 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 can we can have a rest from that word for one week. Um, the way he says it, it I've heard that manner of expression on so many grade cricket fields. Like it, it's it's a quintessential. I don't know if it's a Sydney thing, Ted. But it's like the, the way it comes out of the mouth uh, is um, it, there's a bit of cricket to it. it yeah, there is. It, does that, do you identify with that? Well, I don't use the word personally or professionally, Pez, mm-hmm. but there's certainly, I think you're right. And you're on, you're on some kind of thought line here that it did mm-hmm. roll off with the vigor of standing at first slip and a bit of a snarl. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And poor Carl's never played club cricket in his life. So he wouldn't know what to expect when that mm-hmm. was coming at him from, you know, somewhere in the slip squad. You're right. It just as a generalist theme, it is, it, it was kind of sad and distressing. Um, but the, the one thing I will say is, you know, they, they often say you judge by the company you keep. And if if you're on holidays with Anthony Bell, celebrity accountant, and Carl Stefanovic, you only have to Google the name to see what, what's been involved there over the years. Stuff like this is going to happen. And so mm. was it surprising? No, it wasn't. Is it sad? Yes. Should it be in the public eye? No. But you're right. The, the subplots uh, have have tickled a few people let, let it be said i oh, like i mean you, you you've been plenty of um former player whatsapp groups you don't have to confirm this but i've got absolutely no doubt they were pinging off out, out of their minds uh when um when what this about, happened i mean yeah, you only need to look at at twitter and the trending on the day that it hit the the socials mm. the two the two things that were trending were michael clark and oddly simon Kadich. and i was thinking this is before i sort of caught wind of the story i was thinking simon Kadich is he de-? you know thinking yeah yeah no, don't get don't give me 2022 again please tell me mm. simon Kadich hasn't had a heart attack yeah but no it was just merely people commenting over his his friendship with michael clark on the other hand, as one former player said to me, um, I'd love to be fucking around in those circles. So, you know, each to their own. Uh, I don't know that they actually mean that. They couldn't be anyone possibly in their right mind that thinks that's a good idea. Uh, there's no good segue for this other than to say that the Australian women uh, have demolished. <laughs> oh, yeah, your agenda is off, mate. Your agenda scheduler. Or is, is it? Or is, is it? No. Um, no. Or is it? Ad break. Uh, Insert ad break. The um, that they they swept Pakistan. They demolished oh, them. Oh, it was um, as predicted. It, and and it still engenders a very particular type of safety for me. I just think it bears repeating. I mean, I feel mm. it's a broken record with the Australian women's team. But as long as they continue uh, defeating hapless oppositions, uh, um, then y- you know we can we can stay safe. Uh, this is, this now, is now the same. Just... coming through. Um, I was going to say, this is a team, you got to remember, the, their opposition, Pakistan, was a team that was saved by the rain, the last world, Women's World Cup, from defeat against the might of Thailand. So I, w- I wouldn't mm. say that it's a huge win, but you're right, it, it does create some psychological safety. Have you mm. watched Phoebe Litchfield bat with any? Yeah. Honestly, is it David Gower with slightly longer hair? Um, yeah, like I, I kind of regret it really. Um, and you know, anyone with a, like a, I, I think this is a reflection of a healthy ego, but basically like two years ago, uh, I came across footage of Phoebe Lishfield in the nets and it, it was just some really good net footage. And I, I posted the footage saying something complimentary about her batting, you know, just it being good, mm. probably tried to choose some better words. I brought three or four responses essentially um, called me out for being a nonce. So, you know, it just leaves you, it just, <laughs> you know, it just leaves you conscious uh, of just praising sometimes you're like, well, 
I'm going to, I'm going to be accused of being a child sex offender for exactly. saying she, she times it nicely, but she's made her debut. <laughs> she averages 150, you know, you're who's eating their words now. Exactly. Yeah. Not you, Sam Perry. You called it. You could, you know, work <laughs> some kind of. Meg, Meg Lanning's back officer. 70. Mm. Uh, at least Perry's what, back. It's wasn't all, it's that all safe. safe. Shit. Wasn't that yeah. safe to see Meg Lanning back, just mm. peeling them off behind point a la Damien Martin of the early 2000s. Oh, yeah. wow. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's going to be a tough day when they get beaten, as, as is what happens in sport generally. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of already calling for effigies. Uh, okay. Meg Lanning, Phoebe Litchfield, pretty much all her teammates backed Ash Gardner, who made mm. uh, some strong comments earlier this week on social media uh, about participation in a game of cricket for Australia on Australia Day. Um, Ash Gardner's the Indigenous woman. Her statement said the second it was sorry. Her statement said it was it was a day of hurt and mourning for Indigenous Australians. She said, unfortunately, this year the Australian women's cricket team has been scheduled to play a game on the 26th of Jan, which certainly doesn't sit well with me as an individual, but also all the people I'm representing. For those who don't have a good understanding of what that day means, it was the beginning of genocide, massacres, and dis possession uh the so that's the end that's the end quote of, of what i'm reading out um and ed i think that it's the kind of statement that mainly just bears um listening to and acknowledging um you know and and hearing rather than uh, any kind of is that right or wrong and what what's the what's the place of uh you know of, of symbolism and virtue signaling and empty gestures in all these kinds of things i just think if uh, an indigenous woman says look not sure about this um it's probably just it's, it's it's worth um respecting it well i think without doubt i think that it's a, a topic that we need to continually educate ourselves on and cricket's in a tricky situation because it is a sport for all and so you can't win you can't really win until the government changes the date and we don't need to get too political or even if they do change that cricket is in a rock and a hard place because they need to be seen to be doing the right thing for everyone and that includes acknowledging that it is a incredibly tough day for indigenous australians but also that there are many australians that love celebrating january 26 as australia day as it still is called. And so I feel for the cricket administrators and, and whether there's a game on there or not, it's going to keep popping up. And it used to be a huge celebration, be it an ODI or a mm. test match. And then there was a, a huge uh, big bash and it's kind of gone down the Cricket Australia pecking order. And now there's a, a, a women's T20 game. Mm. But I think next year there's a test scheduled for January 26, is there not? Against the West Indies who... Uh, themselves are obviously quite uh, active in um, mm. the BLM movement as well. So, um, uh, you know, Cricket Australia have a question on their hands. Yeah, I, I mean, I, bring I, back I, an old-fashioned think... rest day. Everyone could go to the Barossa and get hammered, like <laughs> as an homage to Rod Marsh and the yeah. 1970s rest days. I think you see which way the wind is blowing with it as well. Uh, you know, you, you see some pretty prominent businesses now. Um, mm. um, abandoning ways of um, commemorating or celebrating mm. Australia day for what it is. Neutral. Yeah. Uh, you know, I personally, I think there's a, there's generally a, a correlation between um, one's um, education on the issue uh, and relationship with Australia day. Uh, yeah. I think it is a day of hurt for a lot of people. Uh, and I think that conversations about the appropriateness of it are entirely reasonable uh so, well so um, without being an echo chamber pez one thing that mm. they could do and not to uh cast some kind of comedic light but if if they did schedule the day five of the test match against the west indies you're almost <laughs> guaranteed that there'd be no cricket played and you wouldn't have to worry about it that's a fantastic shout that's fucking that that's that's scheduling wizardry thank you uh right which is which is needed more it than means it won't happen it means it won't happen in cricket. <laughs> nothing with the schedule makes sense in cricket so definitely won't happen we're going to flick over to a couple of interviews now. First, we're going to talk to uh, to Linny from Budgie Smuggler to say thanks for their time um, with TJC. Basically, TJC couldn't do um, what it's done without Budgie Smuggler, truly, and I'll explain that in the interview. Uh, then we're going to talk to Dan Christian. Then we're going to talk to Steve Eskenazi. All those interviews are brought to you by our great mate Watto at T20 Stars. You can get any T20 Stars kit at t20stars.com. I reckon if you go on the website, you're getting a massive discount on that at the moment. Uh, and if you want his book, Winning the Inner Battle, which a lot of people are talking up and Excellent saying is pretty book. decent. Yeah. I've read it. Um, Loved it. Got a signed copy, yeah. actually. 
Me too. Uh, yeah. He, um, yeah, I got, I got a note inside it actually from when he did our live show. He said, Sam, thank you for laundering my image. Um, Shane Watson. No, um, <laughs> you can get that at shanewatson.au. He's given you value and he's helped us out here on this show as well. So let's throw over to Linny, followed by Christo and Steve. Elliot Smith's fond farewell to a friend is ostensibly about death and addiction, and this chat has nothing to do with that um, in any way. Nevertheless, uh, it is a fond farewell to TGC's greatest ever supporter today. Temporarily, maybe. Let's see. But um, more, of a, more of a like, uh, ciao, see you at the ashes. <laughs> okay. All right. Step in. I'm sort of doing my intro here. Um, Budgie and... Uh, TGC happily uh, are hanging up the sponsorship boots after five beautiful years. Uh, and Linny, I thought you put it best on that phone call when you said, look, mate, I'm pretty sure your audience is familiar with the brand by now. Um, <laughs> what, what, what are your reflections on this beautiful time together? Oh, well, it's been a time of um, mutual blossoming, I feel. And I just remembering back to the early TGC days remind me very much of the early budgie days. And sometimes you just need bloody someone to get your arm around you in the corner and help you get from, um, you know, the basement or that we were in a walk-in robe for 10 years. You guys were in a bedroom until not too long ago. <laughs> and to get to that um, next phase where you're not living with your parents as an adult with a child, which I was uh, at one stage a few years ago. So <laughs> Um, that, that is no longer the case. Um, <laughs> Linny, but, but Budgie, uh, like, you know, ultimately tries to unwind stigmas around, you know, body shame and the ensuing, ensuing insecurity, uh, that come with, with that. Whereas cricket is nothing but those things. Um, so do you think this was the greatest brand alignment in modern digital media? Um, yeah. I mean, don't take my word for that. It's been um, spoken by many a uh, marketing executive who can, I cannot name at this um, exact point in time. But yeah, like cricketers are a bit weird. Let's be, uh, let's be frank. I've spent a lot of time living in and around cricketers. I lived with Stephen O'Keefe for sort of eight, nine years mm. um, and a few other from the grade um, cricket circuit. Very weird um, bunch. And uh, that... Weird and Budgie are two two peas in a pod. So and also, you know, Budgie is a is a small bird. So it's like you're you're hiding a, a small bird. Um, so I think it's uh, got a bit of a sense of humour that that cricketers can can get around. Linny, uh, you know, what, what would you say to any player, and that's with an A at the end of player, um, out there who like who may be listening to this going. Mm, you know, TJC is home to a global audience uh, with a very ta targetable demographic. Um, they have engaged, they have an engaged audience of between 60 to several hundred thousand um, people from week to week with um, some no bullshit data to support that claim. I wonder if they'd be an effective partner for our brand. Yeah, well, I mean, I think probably the best example of that is one, we're around for five years and two, we will 100%, um, we will 100% be back um, clamouring to, to sponsor the the podcast again through um, periods coming up. So like, yeah, if you're a brand looking for um, 18 to 40 year old males that are mildly insecure, um, both about their game and their life, um, you know, moderately not that well adjusted, probably have some um, couple of weird habits and some odd subscriptions, then um, TGC is the, the place to be. I can give the boys a call. That's a big market, uh, to be fair. Um, Basically, most men. <laughs> um, in, oh, I've been a dickhead till now, but um, it, literally since the start of the podcast. But um, there, there was a moment, Linny, and I just want to share this. There was, there was a moment at the commencement of COVID where TGC, to keep things going, was considering uh, a, a very, like, um, you know, like a very dignified offer from a media player to purchase the license to the podcast, um, which would have, and I never sort of said this on the air before, but um, it would have had uh, like um, flow on Im like impacts uh, and um, 
I put it to you uh, as our sponsor at the time, more as a um, courtesy because it was something that um, we needed we, we needed to take, given what had happened with COVID. And um, you replied with um, an email which contained uh, lines along like that that said, um, "You may have had a bottle of wine, but you're going to try and do some numbers on this." And it also had a picture. I don't know if you remember this of Steve prefontaine um with a quote who's, who's an american athlete from the 70s i guess that says somebody may beat me but they're going to have to bleed to do it um <laughs> and so you gazumped that offer which we didn't expect and and literally that moment has been uh an enormous catalyst in tgc being able to build some serious foundations so it, it you know we say every week on the show this wouldn't be possible without budgie smuggler it sounds trite but it's true uh and um, you know, you, you basically have given us unrivaled support uh, through the extreme undulations of uh, building a digital business. Like, like no, no business has been more practically influential for us in, in assisting, um, you know, where getting us to where we are. So that's what real partnership looks like. And I want to get you on to say uh, thank you. Two, two blokes being earnest with each other, feeling awkward yeah. about it. Um, but I, I thought that would be appropriate. Oh, mate, I, um, I appreciate that. And um, like a lot of things at Budgie, I was just mainly doing it for my own entertainment. I'm a big... Uh, <laughs> no, a that's big not what you meant to, to say, show, bro. And I thought, oh, fuck, if they're going to make this podcast like PG rated, then, you know, what am I going to do with, with my spare time? So mm. um, sometimes I'm a sort of swings and roundabouts person, like not everything has to like neatly add up on a um, on a spreadsheet. Um, pin, pin the ears back. Yes, yeah, someone's going to beat you. They're going to have to bleed to do it. I love Steve Prefontaine. He's one of my favorite um, favorite athletes of, of all time. Um, so yeah, and you guys have pinned the ears back. The show's um, blossom. I think whether you're a great cricketer or a test cricketer, um, I just love even now when there's like, serious cricket articles that you guys are the, are the go-to people um, to, to talk about test cricket. Where does grade cricket fit into um, the overall picture? Are you only two good games away from a state and then test contract, which um, all grade cricketers are? So uh, the, the love is mutual and uh, yeah, we're gonna be, um, Budgie Smug will be popping up on the show uh, plenty of times into the into the future, so we won't be there every week. You've probably got sick of talking about us after five years coming up with a creative two minute um, interlude about Budgie Smuggler. Um, we'll probably get a challenge. It's like over two hundred shows, so um, yeah, we're just pumped that, that that you guys are bigger boys now, and um, look forward to to the next round. Um, to celebrate all this, and I did mention this at the top of the show, Linny. Um, you, you're throwing the gates open to budgiesmuggler.com. Um, you're going to get 20% off. What is it, site-wide? Oh, site-wide, the... everything. Site-wide. We, really, like... we don't really discount very often, but uh, I think we've come up with a code for it as well. You base it on yeah. yourself, Pez. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, weekly. No, um, rig. Rig is the code. Capital, site... capital letters. Cap rig. Capital letters, oh, rig. Okay. Uh, you get, I was thinking about Visa V, but I thought that might be a bit too difficult. But um, Rig is the code, 20% off site wide to the end of the month. And uh, no, till, Linny, till the next uh, test, till India. Till, okay, Feb 8, I think Feb, it, Feb 10. Feb, Feb 9, 10. I think. Nine. I'm not, I'm not no, counting right. down the days. Feb 9 to 13, it's going to be, um, yeah. I, think we're, I think we're half a shot. I'm not mm. getting my hopes up like super high, but mm. fuck, we got a pretty good team. So I'm. Um, I'll, I'll be glued to it. Might have been nice if your ex ha housemate's calf uh, didn't keep blowing, uh, but um... mate, Socky, uh, he's taken a few wickets this year, though. I tell mm. you what, four for ten the other night. Mm. Um, I think he's going about five and a half and over, but he pulls a hamstring going to get a bloody cup of tea in the morning. So, um, but yeah, he's, he's actually you know, he's played pretty much all the season this year. So mm. um, it's been. Been good watching him. I don't think he'd stand up in um in India for this for this series. He's 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 carrying a couple of kgs that might not. He come back lighter, I guess. But um, yeah, it's tough work <laughs> over there. Uh, 
not for me to judge. I, I figured, Lenny, just to finish off, would you join me um, in unison saying um, you can get that discount 20% off using the code RIG at budgiesmuggler.com. Dot au. Dot au, if you want. You heard it here first. Cheers, Lenny. Love you, Spez. Cheers, boys. Normally, before we start recording with interviewees, I ask the interviewee if there's anything I'd like to say uh, before we commence. And what was really nice before we got on air was that everyone just said, I love you to each other. And that was nice because there's just three sort of Sydney first graders knocking around to this interview. And 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 it's about time um, that, that this kind of quality turned up. And uh, with that in mind, a great pleasure to welcome back um, Dan Christian to the show. Christo, welcome. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. I'm just filling in. Um. It's all good. Um, okay, all. Christo, uh, <laughs> I see you resplendent in your Sixers kit. That's nice, uh, and and that's professional because this is the biggest Very cricket, b- uh, biggest cricket sports. program um, in in the world. Um, it's uh, I, I just in, in a Sixers context, Christo. Like it's a very long preseason that Shippy uh, submits you guys to. It must be um, relieving to you that the real competition is about to start. <laughs> It's been a, uh, we've been playing some pretty good cricket, haven't we? It's, um, and it certainly feels like, it's actually felt like that as part of the reason I'm retiring because the, the normal games are just, they, they lose their, uh, they lose their excitement in there and they're, um, mm. but you don't get the same sort of buzz mm. game I mean, three be, in front of a couple of thousand be, people. Must be hard wandering at seven, facing three balls, bowling six balls, taking a catch and shaking hands. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. the, that, that thrill must really wear off quickly. I've got the best, I've got the best job in, in uh, well, 2020 cricket at the moment in this team. I only have to bat when we're in trouble and I only have to bowl when we're in trouble, which is very, very rarely. Other and teams when you were... played in, in the same role, I, I bowl my four overs and, and face 40 balls. <laughs> <laughs> When you were coming through the ranks as a junior, again, all of us sort of came through together, uh, sort of varying results, but, um, uh, and, and you were sort of scoring hundreds and taking fifers and sort of bumping young, um, you know, debutants, um, sort of all game and, and really, uh, um, in a really hostile way. But, um, did you think one day, you know, uh, uh, the, the result would be, I will, I will, um, bowl six balls and, and, and face three, um, when it all finishes up? No, I didn't, but, uh, I suppose it's been trending that way. The, I started off bowling lots and you know, opened the bowling a bit early in my BBL career and was batting at four. And now, I'm, as you say, I'm facing three balls and bowling six. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> but um, I still you, get to keep playing. In all seriousness, you, you announced your retirement from T20 cricket uh, last week and you're, you're a player of universal respect uh, across all of cricket, which is why I said universal. Um, obviously, you, you guys, Ed and Dan, like you both came through at the same time uh dan are you are you wistful about retirement like do you get nostalgic about it like does, does it matter to you how you um might want to be remembered or is it just the the end and you're on to the next thing uh probably a combination there are um oh, there's i i definitely feel like i'm i'm playing oh, i'm nowhere near my best at the moment don't get me wrong but i feel like i'm doing enough to contribute and i want to make sure that i'm still doing enough to contribute i don't want to I don't want to go out. I don't want to finish playing, you know, being useless. And I don't want people to that to be the last memory of the way I played my cricket, I guess. So um, while I'm still doing bits and pieces and, and you know, helping us win games, I'm, um, yeah, happy to hang them up. And, um, yeah, it's been a good run, but, yeah, I've had enough. It's been a hell of a run, Christo. I think the thing that, that uh, your career leaves me is – everyone that has played cricket with you has loved playing cricket with you. And, and people always talk about hundreds and the premierships and bits and bobs. So when it's all said and done, you remember the friends that you've made throughout the time, I'm sure you've probably starting to feel the same as you get a bit more nostalgic, but you know, uh, anyone that shared a change room with you just loved playing with you. Conversely, anyone that played against you hated playing against you. <laughs> When, when did when did you mellow? Because Sam used the word hostile before, you know, hostile fast bowler. I was on the end of some fearful sprays, but you know, <laughs> we we obviously reconciled our differences over the years and, and became you know firm and fast friends. Yeah, of course. I, I reckon that the early um, the early influence uh, my hostility would be probably my Jeff Lawson upbringing at the University of New South Wales. He was, um, 
played the game hard, he played the game really hard. And that's sort of the way that I was brought up to play it hard as well. And, and, you know, be the first one to shake hands and, and grab a beer in the change room afterwards and, um, and have a chat about it and a bit of a laugh. And then you do all the same thing next week. So um, certainly mellowed a bit in my older age. I think the, I think also the fact that we tend to play, um, you tend to play with most of the guys that you play against these days, somewhere around the traps in some format or, or some competition somewhere around the world or around the country, wherever it may be. So I guess you don't have that. You get to know guys a lot better because then you don't, you don't tend to have those same kind of hostilities on the field. Um, there is one funny story I tell lots of people, Ed, about a, comp a game we played in, and I've actually used this. I've used this to this day. Oh, I, only used this a, I only used this a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, oh, God, let's use it again. We're playing a um, we're playing a practice game up in um, Maroochydore. And I can't remember. I was playing for the Vicks or the Sackers, one of them up there against against Ed playing for Tassie, and Ed was smacking us absolutely everywhere. And I and he had he'd been facing the spinners, and he had no helmet on. And um, I came on to bowl, and Ed says to me, "Right, I'll do your deal. If you don't bounce me, I won't slog you." <laughs> I said, all right, deal. So I just ran in like, you know, bowl slow balls and top of off and whatever. And Ed just knocked them for one. And then you could run in and bowl bounces at everyone else you wanted. So in turn, I've used that quite a few times in competitions around the place. <laughs> memorably, most memorably against Lockie Ferguson, you know, 2020 over in England, he had like, he had three or four or five for spit against us. And he was bowling like the absolute wind. Uh, and uh, I walked out to bat and I was like, right, Lockie, you know what time of the game it is. It's at the end of the inning, so I'm going to try and slog you. How about you don't bounce me and I won't try and slog you? And sure enough, worked perfectly. Not as stupid as that looks, Sam. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> anyone, anyone listening will be able to use that. Um, Christo, like, I, I know it doesn't like, directly relate to you, but I think it does relate to all of us. Uh, um, the Sydney smash the other night where um, the amazing golfing class between two teams was revealed. Um <clears throat> Uh, there was a there was a moment you might not have caught it, but it turned up on TV where um, David Warner was welcoming Ollie Davies, um, and firstly he went to meet him, which I think is extremely village, but who am I to say? Um, but he he then he then referred to him as champion, um, to which Ollie Davies responded, "Don't champ me, mate." And then um, Warner sort of repeated it, then called him rock star. Now, where do you sit on that really important um, social episode? Um. I think David's played enough games at particularly at test level to call youngsters, whatever he likes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I'm, I'm okay not. with Ollie. I'm okay yeah. with Ollie telling him not to chant me, but I feel like it's, you know, the Dave's in a position where he can do that. Would you agree that like, uh, th there is a small sect of Sydney rugby league where champion can be said, um, kind of affectionately, like it's not necessarily a turn of term of condescension, but it has, you know, like, I mean, I feel like TGC has played a decent role in popularizing, you know, how much condescension happens with champion and champ and, and it's, and it's cousins, Chumps, the Lise, Champions League, Bud, Chief, etc. But maybe Warner was just being affectionate, calling him champion. Potentially he was. Yeah. I, um, so I grew up, I actually grew up with, so my old man and all of his, brothers were boxers and uh they used to call me champ all the time growing up and it was an affectionate term back then and mm -hmm. it was a, it was a very affectionate and respectful term to call someone champ in the in the boxing fraternity so mm -hmm. i'm not sure at what stage or how it became such a such an insult in the cricket world but um yeah when i first heard it i wasn't really i was you know i wasn't sure why it was an insult or how it was an insult but anyway obviously uh, the longer you spend in cricket the more you realize it's frowned upon Somewhere is between it... Old Kings and Howl 2002. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that little yeah. triangle and time zone, I think, is where it happened. Is it fair to say that's uh, your sort of retirement wish to, to, to bring back the champ? Hmm. No, no, I'm not, I'm not bothered. I like it. I, I've, I've used it condescendingly on social media before when people mm. have, mm. <laughs> when I feel like I need to finish a conversation with someone or they've, <laughs> big for their boots. <laughs> uh, I, and and sp speaking of people who need to be champed on social media, um, I just thought I'd ask you about uh, um, those who have responded to Ash Gardner's um, important comments uh, the other day about um, playing on Australia Day and what 
that means to her and how it makes her feel and many people feel um, as a proud Indigenous man yourself. Uh, there's a hell of a segue from the word champ, but um, <laughs> what, 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 what did you make of that? Oh, I thought she was well within her rights and um, and I, I love the fact that she's she's got the confidence to use her platform as a as an Australian player and as a proud Aboriginal woman to to um, you know, stand up and and speak about what she believes in. I think there should be more of that kind of thing from from people in her position and people in our position of of um, you know being role models in the community. If there's if there are social issues that that people believe strongly enough about, then they they should be able to stand up comfortably and um, and convey their thoughts. Christo, thanks so much for joining us, brother. No worries. Thanks, guys. Absolute pleasure to be joined by Middlesex, Scorchers, and most importantly, Sydney, formerly Bowman Tigers, uh, stick Steve Eskenazi. Steve, welcome to the Grey Cricketer. Thanks so much, Jan. Thanks for having me. Um, Steve, normally when we talk to guys in the Big Bash, there's a really sad vista behind them of a hotel room, but you don't look like you are, are, are in any kind of sad vista and yet you're with the BBL team. Can you please explain? Uh, yeah, currently in my um, family house, must be the only overseas player in the Big Bash to be in his uh, single bed that he was sleeping in when he was 11 years old. So it's been a, a pretty humbling experience, to be honest. Yeah, I need to um, explain that, Steve, as to why your family live in Perth. People would probably think overseas player plays for Middlesex, but they might not know the backstory of you basically mm. being a South African Australian who decided yeah. to leave. Yeah. No, no, no. It's, I got, I got born in Transvaal, English born mum, Zimbabwean dad, played in England, moved to Perth, then to Middlesex, bit of Sydney grade cricket. Now at the Scorchers sleeping in your single bed from 11 years old. And like some would think you're a, you know, a grade cricketer yeah. come good. Others are like, no, he's a skipper of Middlesex. Uh, <laughs> run us through your identity and just your whole mm. backstory. Yeah. I, I guess I've, get bored pretty easy also an Egyptian grandfather no so basically born in South Africa moved to um, the UK when I was two played a bit of cricket there did some junior school stuff and then my old man moved out to Perth when I was about 10 or 11 um, so I lived in Perth played great cricket at Claremont went to Christchurch down the road here in Claremont um, until first year uni did university for a year um, realized it was probably a bit tough for me at that stage, probably still is, and went over to Middlesex when I was 19 and have been pretty much in London ever since. Then a couple of years ago, I decided to come back and play a bit of grade cricket, but a lot of my mates were in Sydney at the time. So I had a guy, Nathan Souter, Middlesex, now Durham, um, was playing at Balmain Tigers at the time, and he got me out there, put me in touch with Big Smithy over there um, at Dremoyne, and I had a couple of pretty successful seasons over there with the Good, good group of lads um, and now back here playing for Perth, which is pretty wild really, to be honest. I, I want to be really clear before I get into the next question that uh, you, you know you have a, a, a pretty healthy first-class career and, and you're clearly on the professional T20 circuit. So I'm careful not to cast you as a grade cricketer, but I have been advised from um, someone at the Tigers. So, so I'm, a, I'm obviously before your time. We didn't cross over, but someone just said to me, please ask him about his first game for the Tigers where it was 46 degrees at Penrith. So I'll just take, take that, that like away. Heaven. That oh, sounds like a joy. This, this is a pretty good story. Basically I had timed my arrival into Sydney Grey cricket perfectly um, by making sure that I arrived on the Wednesday of the second week of the game. And obviously coming off the back of an October as a County player, you know, whether you're in Italy, Spain, the, the darkest streets of London, like cricket's the last thing on your mind. So I knew I wanted to, to hit the ground running, but I thought I'd have a week off. So I'm sitting there in London. I fly in on the Wednesday and I'd organized a massive piss up on the Friday night with all my mates from Sydney. And I was like, no, that's no, all good. I'll be able to roll down to Jamoyne, a little bit dusty with an O flat white in hand um, and meet the boys and it'll be fine. Um, turns out it absolutely lashes down with rain on the first day of the two day game. Oh, no. And no. I'm like, right, well, that's obviously, you know, I, I've made abundantly clear that I'm in no sort of physical or mental state to play a game of cricket after six weeks off. Um, but Michael <laughs> Hare, the DOC there, and Dan Smith, you know, they, they saw otherwise and they thought it was a fantastic opportunity to get me in and around the group. Um, but, you know, life goes on. And so the concert still went ahead um, and I still went to said concert until reasonably late. So I rock up and, and Sydney's an interesting place. It's not like Perth when it's when it's rained all week and then it's muggy and hot. It's probably the worst place. I felt like I was batting in Dakar. Anyway, so we field all day, first 50 overs, and it's the longest. The, the cooch grass, I reckon, is about 
15 inches. I'm basically sinking and it's like the Amazon rainforest. And <laughs> we then walk off the field. I drop a catch second over their best player, skims the side of my head and I'm told them that I'm a gun slipper, like amazing slipper. I've fielded there for five, six years, no issues at all. So I throw that one on the deck, swiftly out of there, down that third man. Um, then we're chasing 220 and I'm like, I've sobered up a bit. I'm fine. I'm a bit dusty, but it's not shocking, but I'm feeling a little bit tired. We then go bang, bang, and I'm batting. And third ball, hit a cover drive run, full body cramps, like literally full body cramps, <laughs> can't move a muscle. And I'm like, oh, I can't tell anyone this. And the bloke at the other end, Benny Menenti is like, mate, are you all right? What is wrong with you? And I'm like, no, 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 it's all good. No stress. Two balls later, I'm like, I can't continue. I, I can't continue to bat here. So the runner, the game stops for 15 minutes and I'm like, look, I can't bat. I have full body cramps. I can stand. And they're like, right, we'll have a runner. The Sydney Uni skipper's like, this is the rarest thing ever. Like, are you injured? I'm like, no, no, no. He's like, but you, you want a runner still? I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he comes out. All good. So then I get to about 16. And I'm like, oh, six weeks off. I'm actually getting them right here. Like a couple of good drives, bit, a spattering of clapping up there in Des Moines. Then... This is where it gets really interesting. I dab one to third man and sort of set off for a run as you do when you have a runner, you forget he's sort of there. And two steps down, I um I realize I have the runner. The non-striker then runs in, makes his ground at my end. The runner runs to the other end, makes his ground at um at his end. And I'm just sort of loitering about a meter from the crease, just tapping down, trapped, you know, thinking I'm going to set myself in. It was going to be a heroic story, out all night, 75 not out, new teammates, playing through cramps. Like, I was going to be a hero. Um, the keeper then smashes all three stumps out of the ground and the umpire puts his finger up. And I'm like, well, that's not out, obviously. I'm like, the non-striker's in and the runner's in and they're the only two blokes that matter in this in this situation. <laughs> And they're like, no, mate, you also have to be in your crease. You're out. And I'm like, nah. I was like, I played eight years. I played nine years of professional cricket. Like, pretty sure I would know if I was out. Pretty and sure. Like, I'm like looking around and everyone's like, get off, you're out. And I walk <laughs> off and I'm like, so I've dropped the catch. I've ran with a runner. I've never been so embarrassed. And then I've completely forgotten one of the rules of cricket. And now I'm out. I was absolutely mortified. And we got battered by about 130 runs. And I was like, this could be a long summer in Sydney for me. <laughs> Embarrassed the entire professional unit of... of oh, that is... Uh, genuinely not, didn't know awesome. Genuinely didn't know the rule. Like, honestly thought that if both people were in, you were absolutely fine. And I was in the middle of the pitch. Like, it wasn't like I was a bit out. I was in the middle of the pitch. So that was... That was a that was the old uh, welcome to, to first grade sort of day for me. That was a tough one. Mm. And and with but, all the cricket you've played, obviously, like um, you know, Middlesex, domestic T Twenty circuit, BBL, like you probably say, Sydney grade cricket. Even though it's got a couple of issues, you know, with selecting seventeens and nineteens players only, um, Sydney Sydney grade cricket is, is is the toughest standard you've played. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and to be honest, none of the however many thousands of runs I had scored. In first class cricket, held me instead for getting um, abused, like I've never been abused, next to the Parramatta Eels football stadium when it was forty three degrees, and I'd rather <laughs> have been anywhere else in the been world. There. So been there. Kings, so. <laughs> been, been, been there. Um, you, stole, you stole my question, Pez, because I was going to oh, ask Steve why he left. I mean, why why would you ever want to leave the the glories of, of Premier cricket? How much easier is county cricket, and is it really just club cricket played over four days? Yeah, no, exactly. Well, I think. Sydney grade cricket for me, I, I basically completed it. I think I averaged about 70 for four years in a row. So I was, I was sort of done with that. Um, went back and uh, did the obligatory averaging somewhere in the mid to low 20s when I went back to England. Um, and then just decided I'd seen enough of having to try and find a park on Bondi Beach and realised North Cottesloe was slightly easier to have a dip. So it made a bit of sense for me to come back here. <laughs> um, and you've uh, you've slotted in at, at the Scorchers. You've played seven games, two fifties, averaging thirty odds, striking at one forty. Let's say, loving it, um, loving it. Is is BBL oh. piece of piss or what? Absolutely. Well, the irony is, like my first games, I think first two games I got one and ten. Felt like I was batting with a wine bottle. Then <laughs> managed to get one or two away in Sydney. Then. Absolutely round back at them everywhere at the SCG <laughs> and everyone goes, oh, no, no, yeah, you've played well. You know, we missed, we, 
we're seven runs short and I'm not out after 20 overs, striking at about 111, had an absolute mare. Then come back to Perth and get naught off two. And I'm like, this is not going anywhere near to plan for me. Um, and then it's just funny how the game, then you get a leg stump half volley the other day and everyone thinks you're the best thing since sliced bread. So yeah, I, d- I don't really know, to be honest. Any any number of things could happen in the finals. I could either get naught off one and naught off three and get abused by the Perth public who are quite passionate mm-hmm. or go all right and be get the keys to the city. Honestly, like that, that that kind of attitude um is probably the most concerning thing for the grade cricketer as a business. Like it, it occurs to me that a lot of cricketers have worked out that um you shouldn't give expectations to yourself, that you shouldn't treat the game as like a as a brutal um it's piece sad. of chaos in your life. Like people actually seem to be seem to be just having fun and accepting whatever happens and 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 acknowledging the randomness of the game. Um, um yeah, you I, know, I, I, I sort of disagree. I think obviously fundamentally um, doing well in cricket means you're a good bloke and not doing well means you're a bad bloke. And that needs to be remembered at, at pretty much all times. Don't you think? You know, took, took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> um, okay. Finally, Steve, I know we, we don't have you for a long amount of time. You know, the BBL guys are always got to move along and, and the media liaisons always say that it's, oh, it's just crazy. Um, but um, you, you, you're averaging 40 across T20 cricket across the world, um, striking at 140. Uh, overlooked for the hundred a couple of times in a row is inclusion there the next step for you and you know have you have you done something to somebody um is there any apologies you need to issue you can do so on this show yeah i don't know reasonable sense of irony not being able to make literally your own domestic comp where they pick 90 players but then playing as an overseas when there's like 11 of you in the competition (laughs) so it is such a good question Although August time in London, when you're not playing in the 100 and you're playing in the sort of second rate 50 over competition, is um, it's got its perks as well. So I'll see you next year. I don't know. I think Provence in August is actually not a, not a bad spot. Mm, but I wouldn't mind getting into that comp. Mm. Steve Eskenazi, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, gents. Is, is she back, the BBL? Do you think? Like, there's a, a lot of talk, a lot yeah. of talk saying the BBL's back, and you got to, you're always a little bit, uh, you know, healthily skeptical about what the tastemakers are saying. Mm. I mean, um, crowds are back, and that matters. Uh, and so, crowd means vibe. No COVID also means vibe. What about the standard, Ed? Because uh, you know, you, you're the pro. I feel like I'm, there's some good shit going on and we're, we're, we're you know, we've, we've talked about Steve Smith, but um, I'm still seeing a lot of games where teams need seven and over with plenty of wickets in hand, six or seven overs to negotiate. And there's a lot of gas trucking going on. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it's PGs, we're hung over, it's yeah, yeah, Sunday, yeah. I'm scared. Home, yeah. There's a wind whipping up and someone's bowling a little bit fast, you know, like to me, to me being able to manage and navigate those chases is really the, um, is this, is the sign of a strong T20 team and the sign of like, like that's guys are at the cutting edge of T20 cricket manage those things. And if you do gas truck it needing seven and over, that's usually park stuff. Comment. Happy to pick this up. How long do we have, Pez? And for those, I'm going to give a shameless plug that Corb and I, you know, every Monday on the ABC Cricket Podcast, usually go pretty deep on the Big Bash. So it's mm. it's worth having a, a you know, not it's a bit less lighthearted, but we we get into some bigger issues like this. Mm. I think the, I think generally the vibe of the Big Bash is back. You've picked up on the the zeitgeist in re, in regards to where it is sitting in in in, in the cultural mind at the moment. You're right about the quality. I, I think one thing that has happened is I think the really shit teams have got a little bit better. And so the average game is a little closer. The two best teams are still the two best teams and they're by far and away mm. better than the rest of the competition. And we can, we can get into that. But I, I, I think the addition of the international players has helped elevate it. But the standard is still, there's a reason why Australia's fifth or sixth in the world T20 rankings. The mm. average player in the Big Bash is no better now than they were probably two or three years ago. How can we continue to to ensure that they improve? Because you're right, the middling games have been average, but they've also evened themselves out because two, when two average teams play each other, there tends to be a, a close result and, and that plays to the entertainment factor. But it's, it's great to have the crowds back. I think... Um, 
it's interesting and slightly counterintuitive that for years we've been saying as the big bash has faded, the season's too long, the season's too long. We're going to cut games. It goes on for way too long. And all of a sudden the, the competition's got a bit of momentum. We're talking about cutting back the season, which will happen in two years time. And, and no doubt administrators can't win and people will have an uproar on, on that as well. So it's great to see uh, the big bash where it's at. I think, as I said, the, the, the sixes and the sixes and the scorchers are by far and away. They're, they're world-class T20 teams. The stars absolutely woeful. They need a total clean out. We could take this in so many different directions. So I'll throw it back to you. Yeah. I, th- th- there's like two hours in it <laughs> in, yeah, in the BBL. I mean, I, want, I was going to ask you whether I, I just want to get existential that bit, the BBL whenever we see it. You know, like rather than looking at the micro of which players are good, who's hot, who's not, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I when it gets momentum and it is hot and the crowd is making noise that you don't, you good haven't problem. heard since since a one day uh, at the SCG That's in ex- the mid nineties. So funny know, and you it's, say and it's, that. And it's, occupy, it's occupying yeah. that place in the consciousness of of cricket fans. You know that real um context and yep. fun wild experience of cricket as contextualized with Test cricket. You know it is you can see the value and the power of what that thing is, but until it is in a position where it is able to and aggressively attracts the best players possible uh, mm. both around the world and its own players. It is always going to have a hit and giggle cartoonish feel and cricket Australia doesn't exist in a, in its own vacuum. You know, it is subject now to global and economic trends that it is not in control of where it used to be. Mm. And I, I don't know what it looks like. So I'm just somebody offering problems, but um, I do wonder if in, though it's hard to see, but if in 20 years time, 30 years time, it'd be quite clear that the big batch is the main thing that Australia does in the summer, you know, yeah. uh, b- because at the moment it just, it just pains me that it cannibalizes itself by denying the test players the opportunity to play. I know they're getting a couple of games here. They won't next year uh, that they have to find a way for our best players to participate in this competition. So much to un- unpack there. The, the first mm. thing you said, and I'll, I'll work through it, but I was at this uh, SCG for Steve Smith's 100 on Saturday night. Mm. I haven't heard an ovation like that in 20 years, probably since Michael mm. Bevan hit, the, mm. uh, wow. hit the, the last ball for four against West Indies. It was absolutely electric. Mm. And the length of the ovation, the noise was phenomenal. Mm. So you're right. It, 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 it captures that energy that very few forms of, of cricket can mm. but there's no denying that the big bash is at the moment still a tier two maybe even tier three event globally when it comes to to t20 cricket in terms of how it attracts the best players the window that's carved out for it and, and the interaction between even its own best players and so you're right that the risk being that with the indian teams uh in the IPL having essentially bought the South African league that they all just start shipping their players around the world. And, and it's mm. kind of this moment in, in world cricket that we'll look back on in 20 years time. That could be the moment much like football that when it moved from international play to professional club base play and, and, and franchise essentially is that, that it, it could become the dominant part of, of an Australian summer, but ha- how that, needs to interact with the existence of test cricket. They're, they're huge questions for the administrators to answer. But the worst thing that can happen is for the big bash to carve out time and, uh, you know, test cricket dies essentially. And it's a, the, the equivalent of the A-League. You know, that would be mm. an absolute disaster. How mm. can it be the second best competition in the world behind the IPL? Mm. That is the question that needs to be answered. And currently mm. it's not. And there are, there are a few deciding factors that would need to structurally change for, for it to be the case. And I think, you know, like good, good management is not often about solutions, but about asking the right questions. And, mm. you know, it, it will be interesting to know whether that question of how does the BBL become the next best comp after the IPL becomes the key question of Australian cricket and what yeah. hard decisions need to be taken, including with test cricket that will help make that the case. Uh, but it is, it, it is a really complex one. Um, 
you'll probably find the next one complex too, Ted. Uh, you would have seen this article uh, by by possibly a club mate of yours or he plays at your club, um, Dani Saeed, young journo writing for News Corp, taking on a topic that I think a lot of people in New South Wales have been talking about, but people mm. are too afraid to talk about, you know, among the big wigs such as yourself. So let's just pick it up. But the article headline and foxsports.com screamed.com.au, mm. I should say. It's not on the American yeah. side. It's a disgrace. Mm. Cricket New South Wales slammed over controversial Bang. selection policy. Now, just to be clear, Dani doesn't write those headlines, but I did think it was a very good choice of topic uh, to pick up. Mm. For background, New South Wales men's cricket hasn't been going very well. Nope. Uh, it, it's It's got the highest population for the next couple of years anyway, uh, New yep. South Wales. It's traditionally uh, the superior state. Um, it hasn't been performing at the levels that it normally does. And I think appropriately people want to know why. Now you're on the board of Cricket New South Wales. So obviously yep. it's going to, I'm going to get hugely um, uh, open comment from you here, but uh, did you see the article? what did you make of it? I did, and I did what do you think that. of the, what do you think of the premise that uh, too much focus on needing to make 17s and 19s and ignoring the fucking core of grade cricket? <laughs> I mean, I, I can make comment and I'll be quite open with it because I'm, you know, part of my board responsibility is to chair the cricket committee, which essentially mm. is dealing with exactly this problem on a, mm on a weekly, monthly and yearly basis. So I think the comments and correct me if I'm wrong, was spurred by Stuart Clark on the ABC during the mm -hmm. test match. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And the journalist has picked up on them. And, uh, what confuses me a little bit as, I mean, this is nothing new Pez. The, as soon as any state team does poorly, it's, it's very easy to start pointing the fingers at the high performance selection policy. So I'm happy to, work through this. I, I am curious as to if Safraz being Stu Clark has actually been paying attention to the selection. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in which selection he's referring to, because I actually think there are two big issues as to why New South Wales hasn't been doing well. One is the senior players haven't been performing. Mm. And so when you have people who are pressing one year or two years ago for test selection are now not really uh, the leading run scorers or leading wicket takers that that can hurt a team. Mm. And secondly, is I think we've underinvested in quality coaches, and mm. uh, you know that has had a flow-on effect with the younger players getting better. So when you look at the actual selections, I'm curious to I'll I'll ask the question: who sh who would you pick instead of the people that are being picked? So when you when you look at a Blake Nikataris, you're talking about someone who's dominated club cricket and second 11 cricket. When you look at someone like Matt Jilks, he's someone who's dominated club cricket to the point that he broke his finger in a shield game, went back and scored 200 for his club team to force reselection having been dropped from the shield team. So uh, if you look at that actual shield team, the, the young players that they're picking are the ones that are dominating club cricket. So um, um, it's just such yep. a lazy analysis to say, mm. if you're not part of the pathways, you don't get looked at. I mean, yeah, sure. We, you know, Anthony Sams and, and Scott Rogie, they're, they've been great club cricketers, but they're now in their mid thirties. And so the people dominating club cricket, it, it's just not a viable option. The, the, mm. the pathway for test selection is to play shield cricket. And so you really do need to think about who it, it's a balance between picking your best team and also understanding that it is a, a, a mechanism for, for, for test selection and so uh, I'm, I'm just a bit confused by the the purpose really uh, and can i, I guess, ask one question yeah sorry go on okay. well i was just gonna say i understand the anger because i'm as angry as anyone you saw i should be within a within reason challenging that for the sheffield shield year in year out inexcusable that they're not but i think the way it's structured now the way michael klinger who's head of male cricket interacts with clubs on a weekly basis to to say that people aren't being monitored out of club cricket. He's getting reports every single Monday from club coaches. Mm. So, and a huge effort's been put into trying to make sure that premier cricket is folded into elite cricket in New South Wales. So it's, mm. it's, it's just such mm. a lazy analysis. 
Um, I noted, uh, I just want to ask one more question about it because we're going to move on. But uh, I, I did note among his comments, he mentioned that uh, to your point, he monitors it quite closely. He asks for feedback from every single coach uh, from first grade cricket. And I love we get into this gear at the moment because we're about to talk about bored apes hacking RCB's Twitter account. But um, uh, he did mention among the things that he asks for from coaches, he, not only what were the conditions like, but who were the opposition? And I just wondered yep. uh, whether that was, you don't need to answer this, but whether that was a little comment on the quality uh, of, of oppositions that some people may be scoring hundreds against. Um, you don't have to comment on that. What I did want to know is instead of looking at grade cricket, this would be my question. And the thing that concerns me most about New South Wales cricket is it's less about grade cricket, though we care about it and it's test level. Um, but to me, New South Wales cricket has always been um, Australia focused. It's always been about producing Australian players. And uh, and it, it, it will be easy to say, well, look, hang on, New South Wales still has five or six of the best um, Australian players knocking around. My question to that would be, yes, of course, and it should, but... Um, you know, who, who was the last one? Who was the, who was the, la who, who, who was the last yeah. one that, you know, was forming a foundation of the Australian cricket team? Yeah. Uh, it's probably Pat Cummins, I, I think, you know, at least well, from a Red Bull perspective. It was, it was Curtis. Was I'm, I'm, okay, with, time, with respect I mean, to KP, he, he, he I mean, did, he did get a test I mean someone who's, um, you're right, but, but I mean, someone who, who's formed a real, a really serious part of it. Um, and, and it would have been great to see Curtis go on as well. You know, that's what, that's what concerns me. It just doesn't seem to be, I, I can't look at a New South Wales side and go, who's, who's, who's coming next? through? Yeah, who's next? And that, always and used to be able to do that. Totally on, that, that's fair. And that's the same analysis that we go through when you're trying to work through a list. And that's why, mm. um, you know, when you're looking at the potential of someone like a Tanvir Sanger, he could be Australia's next spinner. He could play a hundred tests. He could take 400 wickets. And so, you're balancing that with someone who's 31 and takes wickets for fun, you know, on a dust bowl at, you know, Raby number one, Jared Burke spinning, you know, maybe his record no, is, is better than you know, a lovely bowler, but he's not going to play test cricket. And so it is a balancing act, but it's a, it's a fair comment, Pez, for sure. Mm. Um, uh, Ed, I wanted to ask you about India uh, because you've played there. Um, at, at the moment, um, they're playing some white ball stuff as well. Uh, Shubman Gill's made a double turn off 150 rocks against New Zealand. Um, I, I, guess that's, I guess that's really good. If India uh, plays an ODI and it's not on TV, did it ever mm, happen? Mm. Oh, look, cool. There's probably a thousand people who've just said it was on TV. Um, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> but not for us. And at the exact time that we wanted. That's exactly um, right. <laughs> uh, I exactly. think Coley got a ton as well, because uh, he's just oh, doing that again. He he's he's starting this. He's just he's just gearing up at the right time, of course um, as as we always expected. Uh, I I was um, people might be surprised to hear this, but we've sort of been helping promote the uh, Amazon test stock. Uh, I don't I don't know if people have seen that, um, but anyway, how could you miss comment. it? Honestly, how, how could you miss that? I mean, about I, I, let let me skip over that. You're unbelievable. You're unbelievable. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, people asking if there's, if there's, a, there's a bit of Bezos bunts knocking about, um, but, um, in the course of doing that, we went to Sydney and bumped into a couple of the, the boys there. And, um, Who do you mean by just the up, boys? You mean uh, the like, um, yeah, test Amo, guys. So yeah, Amo, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, the big boys. uh. Well, I ran past. I already said this on the show, but like we ran into Pat Cummins, and and uh, it was in it was in the um, salubrious hotel that the uh, Aussies stay in, and um, an elderly, a senior woman heard us both speaking about uh, cricket, and she asked us if we were both players, and I said, yeah. Hmm. We're both players, yeah. Absolutely. And then she, and then I walked off, and she walked down the stairs with Pat, and she said, "Oh, so what's your name?" Uh, which was just awesome. <laughs> um, but um, speaking to Travis Head and Manus. You know, for those two guys, th this is a um, potentially transcendent series for them. I mean, as a bat, mm. the challenge doesn't get harder technically, uh, I'm, I'm presuming. And for those two guys in particular, there's a lot to prove and a lot that we're keen to find out mm. um, in terms of their capabilities. You know, Travis Head looked all at sea in Asia last year, but people are allowed to get better. Uh, and he, he looks to be continually improving. Manus is a number one bat in the world or whatever rankings say. And then you, the next question is, so, you know, how are you going to do that? And I recall Matthew Hayden transcending himself in 01, mm. but by brooming everybody. But what he did was he got a local groundsman yep. to curate a wicket where he could just broom for a month. 
And you asked Manus and Travis Head, how are you guys getting ready for India? Not that I ask it like that because that would sound strange. And they'd be like, I'm going up to the Gabba tomorrow to play for the heat. <laughs> you know, like, uh, and I know they get a couple of days off or whatever, but, you know, you've been there. Is it enough? Is, is it enough preparation for them to expect anything from them? I think the modern, and this is a, this is a fascinating topic, and I'm going to separate the two because I think Manus has all the ingredients to succeed. Mm-hmm. I think Travis probably has to rewire his game against spin, but it's right. a work in progress that we saw at the SCG in the, in that last test match, particularly about playing off the back foot a lot more. Uh, Manus has the advantage of little insight. They've actually got an Indian wicket at the center of excellence up in Brisbane. So he, he could you know sort of has rubber uh, throughout the soil. So it turns a little bit more. So I'm sure he's been working away there. He's a natural sweeper of the ball, but it, we do kind of lament these modern test tours that get jammed in off the back of whatever it might be. There's no lead in tour games or there might be one. It's not enough. If you if you're not a consistent, you know, player in in the subcontinent, it's very hard just to switch gears from from batting in Australia to India. It takes, you know, weeks to in Travis's case, probably months to try and really rewire his technique and understand what can work when balls are spinning and bouncing. Because realistically, the, the wickets that he struggled on in the UAE were as flat as they will ever be in India. They weren't turning and when they were, there was slow turn. It wasn't it wasn't a true test of playing and spin. There was no pace on the ball and there was no bounce, which he obviously loves. And he's a fine player. He's a hell of a player. So I don't want to feel as though I'm being negative, but it's going to be a totally different challenge. He, he's, he, he, you know, and the question then is, do you pick him? It's hard not to having been such a dominant player at home, but you could say the same thing about Dave Warner. So it's going to be interesting. I think Australian batting over there, We've probably got our most suited players in terms of Kawaja, Smith, and Labuschagne that we've had for many, many tours. You know, looking back to the tour I was, went on, it was probably only Michael Clark that was a super accomplished player of spin. But there are three great players of spin in in the lineup now, and so we're, we're a chance of scoring some some decent size runs at least. Okay, so you're bullish about Australia's uh, chances. I'm more India. well. Uh, I'm more bullish than previous tours i think it's <laughs> you're more uh, bullish than tours that you were on <laughs> yeah well, n- not just that even the even the last two have been you know a bit of a bloodbath uh but yeah the, the difference being uh, i think they're they're better better set up to to score more runs on this tour i think okay um look take your pick of these four things you'd like to talk about uh before mm-hmm. we get into hashtag ask TDSC, teddy uh um, Board Ape NFT Yacht Club hacked RCB Twitter. Um, the ILT20, where what is David the Cameron. Hey, what is the uh, ILT? What is uh, that's the one in the UAE, I think, because it doesn't have like a, like a full status because they're not a full member or some shit. Oh, so okay. it doesn't go on your stats, but Hale's got a big, ton and David big, Cameron big was cash. there. doesn't go on your stats, but goes on your yeah, cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think Stornis is off there. Uh, and um, I wonder if he'll yeah, score. Puppies off runs. there. Yeah. Um, the South African one, I think Root did something for someone. Um, and uh, and then there was a report out of the West Indies following their their World Cup men's World Cup failure, saying West Indies cricket may cease to exist as an entity. This group does not indulge in doomsday predictions, but no entity, sporting or otherwise, has a viable future if its talent is not harnessed and effectively managed. Now I've grouped all them together just completely randomly. Um, but yeah, where do you want to start? Like the the yacht clubs NFT stealing the account? Did they uh, actually? Did they actually hack? I mean, that's real bull market stuff. A crypto NFT yeah, hacking in. into a yeah you know, RCB. six million six million followers, and I think they've done it before with RCB. So there's obviously some there's some uh, issue with it. There's always a bit of controversy around RCB. You know, that's a, and I kind of like it. I like the vibe mm. uh, with that. But yeah, you want to start with yeah. Bo- I mean, firstly, bored apes. So, I mean, are we in? Are we are we are we buying? I'm a seller. Surely, surely, honestly, if you if you're still buying NFTs, yeah, you, <laughs> still you are tra- you are trapped in a time I'd machine say of genuine early genuinely. 2022. 21, I lift I lift the lid. We probably had three or four um serious suitors uh, approach the great cricketer to um try and persuade us that uh that our tweets would make great NFTs and uh 
you know, the fact that you, you didn't hear anything after that suggests <laughs> what I actually think about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I don't know. So, so yeah, that, that's, so that was one thing The yacht club hacked into uh, the board, a NFT yacht club hacked into ICB Twitter. Everything's fine now. Uh, and sounds then, like yeah, a, man- it sounds like a hell of a marketing stunt. Surely, surely it goes in the bucket of, you know, we're you think it's to be a marketing bucket. You think, absolute, it's, you think it's a conspiracy? Absolute conspiracy. I mean, I actually think that's where Budgie might be directing their marketing dollars. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. They're tightening those, uh, the Budgie drawstrings away from yeah. the Next thing you know, it's going to be Bored Ape. Yeah, and right. he's overtaken, you know, the, the, the Budgie Shit. Twitter account. I need to get myself into that Bored Ape game. I mean, Linny did say, like, oh, I've enjoyed the two-minute the two minute little creative you guys have done. It's like two minutes, brother. Come on. Fuck, I'm, I'm, we're pushing four or five for you here. But anyway, we, um, uh Okay, ILT20 in the South African one, mate. Any, uh, uh, I mean, what about these, what are, these are the, the West Indies? That, Let's go to the oh, West yeah, Indies okay. first. Sure. Because they are an absolute rabble. Oh, mm. I'm a little Sad. concerned for, yeah, it is. I mean, it's very hard to play as a nation state when your nation state doesn't even exist. And it's this cricket mm. construct that we've built over many years. And we have this glamorous idea of what the West in, Indies actually is and what it constitutes. It doesn't exist. And so why we would, uh, I've sort of thought this through a, a while ago, why we as a sport would continue down this road of hoping that one day the West Indies returns to its glory era, why we don't separate these nations and actually build it up from scratch again. And, and if that means that some become associate nations and have to deal with the funding requirement around that and the bigger nations like Jamaica and Barbados that they can foster their own talent and actually come through the ranks again, much like a lot of, you know, the, the great stories of the last couple of years, like Afghanistan and, and the Netherlands, you know, they can still be super competitive. Mm -hmm. They just have to actually be a bit more strategic around how to, you know, retain and harness talent because Mm -hmm. at the moment it's, it's, it's not sustainable. I think reasonable minds may, you know, can, can differ on this head. Like I, I, you know, I know this won't be in line with your TDM growth partners, politics, but it may be in line with uh, your gig at the wonderful grandstand cricket podcast. I think, global cricket money should be socialized far better uh <clears throat> and i'll have the last word on that because i'm uh, the anchor which is awesome i'm getting to understand the power of this uh ilt 20 and the south african one anything mean anything to you at this point other than the fact that they must have been the major forces shrinking the bbl comp not ex- our um keen <laughs> now keenness for quality that that is exactly i mean you can wrap them into the same the, the same kind of bucket of threats to the BBL and moving down the tier system to, mm. to tier three or tier four, because if one thing I do know is players go where the money is. And if, mm. if they're not being paid appropriately, well, then they're, yeah. they ain't going to play in the big, in the big bash. That is an argument for capitalism, um, which, which tends to win. Um, okay. Ask TJC, Ed, I keep going to say he goes, but uh, it is brought to you by Ponting Wines. Uh, I think you got a funny story from getting on the plane with Ricky Ponting on the way to the West Indies once, but you can tell that another time. Um, Ponting Wines, get whatever you want. Put the, put, the, put, the, put the code get a few in, see what happens. That's about where we're at with that sponsorship, um, which we are very grateful for. Ask TJC. This is from Anonymous. I'm looking forward to reading this to you, Teddy. Uh, boys. My son's newfound love for cricket this summer has brought about a question uh, when we are watching a test match. This question has finally helped me understand why when I was growing up and learning about the game, I was constantly ignored by the men in my life at the time. That question being, is Australia winning? I mean, I could probably just say yes. As you have both eloquently put this summer, that what, that what summer is about in Australia, walking past it, sorry, that's what summer is about in Australia, walking past the TV with raised eyebrows, looking at the score and commenting under your breath about how shit the opposition are. But the cricketing cuck in me can't bring myself to do it. And I find myself continually getting into long-winded explanations about the game within the game, looking at my son with his eyes glazing over, no doubt thinking about BBL, colours, flashing stumps and KFC. 
What I really want to tell him is WinViz is a piece of shit in cricket. No one has, no one ever has a high probability of winning and or wins ever. You will never be good enough or make the right decision when playing this game, even at the highest level. Take the last test of this summer, for example. Australia tried to force a result. Trying to force a result had to declare to get the game moving. However, to the Australian public, Pat Cummins is an absolute wanker because he declared on Kawaja on 195 in a game that was always going to be a draw anyway, quote unquote. And Usman, even though he scored 195 in a master full innings, still couldn't get to 200, could he? Hazelwood has been a stalwart for the Australian lineup for years, but how do the Australian selectors pick him over a guy who averages 12? I don't know where he's going. Um, even Australia's greatest cricketer didn't win. The last ball in his career bowled for a duck and leaving him with an average of a mediocre 99.94. So I guess my question for you both is, uh, is anyone ever or has anyone ever won at cricket? Do I just tell my son to look at Winvis and ignore his question like what was done to me? Cheers, boys. Keep driving on gravel roads. And Do you ever win in cricket? I think it's impossible to win at cricket. Look what it's done to us. Look what it's done to you, Sam. You, I mean, you thought that you won at cricket, and here you are as a professional. I got to tell, I, and 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 to wrap up. Um, firstly, to say thank you to you, uh, Teddy, for joining as co-host. We're very grateful uh, to have someone of your pedigree here to do that, and you've been a great supporter of the show. Um, to he goes, have a great we rest, of son. Yeah, we love to you, Steve and Christo. Yeah. I think if, you, I think it's appropriate to champ him. I would never do that. Like Dave, um, like Dave Warner did to young Ollie Davies. How did that not get it more airtime today? Well, it <laughs> it might have um, on the interviews we haven't done yet. But um, uh, but to to answer those questions about can you ever win at cricket? Um, two stories. Well, two stories. Mm-hmm. Two thoughts. One. In my view, only five Australian cricketers have ever made it in the history of the game. You can't make it. I like the, the rest haven't, and I include you with respect. Bradman made it. Yep. Steve Waugh made it. Yep. Shane Warne made it. Mm. Heath Miller made it. And Vic the Trumper made it. It's um, low, pro- low probability of winning. Stra- you, know, you, you can make you an argument. You, that's right. You can make you can mount an argument for every other men's Australian Test cricketer that they didn't quite make it. And finally, to illustrate that, um, lifting the lid at half time in the Brisbane show, where we're um, grateful enough to have Justin Langer, we went downstairs to the green room, and um, he took his phone out straight away, and um, ostensibly to look at the BBL scores. I'd had a few drinks, and I said, JL, do you, are you seriously into it? And he looked up and he said, yeah, I am. And then he said to me, do you love the game? And I said, oh, I don't know. And then he looked, he looked at me, he said, no, do you love it? And I just said, yes, JL. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>